A warm welcome to our viewers here in Nigeria and around the world. I'm Millicent Mwoka in Lagos. Here are the stories making our headlines this hour. School scorched in Ukraine city of Kramatorsk and more attacks in the Kharkiv region today. Italian Prime Minister Mario Draghi resigns, having lost the support of parties in his government. Plus, Iraq accuses Turkey of an airstrike on its Dohuk province, killing eight people. Turkey denies the accusations. Hello again, and let's just bring you up to speed on developments in the last couple of hours. Hungary's Foreign Minister Peter Sergerto in Soad well, is said to be on his way to Moscow to discuss the purchase of more Russian gas for his country. The ruling Fidesz party says this is to help ensure the security of Hungary's energy supply. The Kremlin says gas delivery problems to Europe were caused by sanctions that create technical difficulties as the Nord Stream pipeline reopened opened after maintenance, but with a reduced flow. Also, the UK says it will be sending scores of artillery, guns and uh, more than 1,600 anti-tank weapons to Ukraine in the latest supply of Western arms to help bolster its defence against Russia. The uplift comes after Boris Johnson last month promised another £1 billion of military support to Ukraine. Defence Secretary Ben Wallace says the UK would also provide counter-battery radar systems hundreds of drones and more than 50,000 rounds of ammunition. The UK has already supplied Ukraine with a range of military equipment, including almost 7,000 anti-tank weapons, hundreds of missiles and armoured fighting vehicles, and has also been training Ukrainian soldiers. Meanwhile, video released by the governor of the Indodonesk region, Pavlo Kurilenko, says or rather shows heavy damage to a school building in the city of Kramatorsk, blaming Russian occupiers. He made a post on social media saying two schools in the region had been hit, one in Kramatorsk and one in Konstantinivka. He also claims industrial areas in Kramatorsk and the city centre of Bakhmut had been shelled. The location of the video was verified by the building, which matched satellites and far imagery of the public school number 23 in Kramatorsk. Well, speaking of Bakhmut, police in Ukraine's eastern Donetsk region have also released a video showing heavily damaged buildings and debris-laden streets in the city. Accompanying text published by the police said Russian missiles had hit 13 settlements in the region, including the cities of Konstantinivka, Kramatorsk and a number of smaller cities and villages. Police say Russian forces used Iskander K cruise missiles, tornadoes, smirch rocket launchers launches and smaller artillery in the strikes in which an unspecified number of civilians were killed or wounded. Ukrainians living in the Donbass region have begun fleeing, fearing, uh, rather fearing for their lives. Uh, Russia intensifies its attacks on the region. Wednesday, women, children and the elderly, some in wheelchairs, were seen boarding the train, settling in the sleeper carriages ahead of a long journey to safety. One of the passengers said she was leaving because the apartment block she used to live in was damaged in shelling and she could not stay there any longer. Another the set she fled the town of Severodonetsk before it was captured by Russian forces. She said she and her family members had to abandon their previous life and have nowhere to go. Well, on the other hand, Russia's defense ministry spokesman Igor Konashenkov says forces shot down a Ukrainian Su-25 airplane near the city of Kramatorsk in the Donetsk region. Explaining further, he said Russian air defense systems shot down an Mi-8 helicopter of the Ukrainian air forces near Povkamiski 
in the Mykolaiv region. After failing to capture the capital, Kyiv, at the outset of the invasion, Russia has shifted to a campaign of devastating bombardments to cement and extend its control of Ukraine's south and east. Well, as the Russian offensive enters its 148th day, we track where battles are taking place and the human cost of the war as more than 9 million refugees streaming out of Ukraine. VOA's Anna Chernikova joins me now from Kyiv. Hi, Anna. Good to see you. According to the Institute for the Study of War, Ukraine conducted a, a second high-precision strike against uh, Antonivsky Bridge, a major Russian logistic artillery east of Kherson. City. What more do we know? Uh, good evening. Uh, yes, um, Ukrainian armed forces in general uh, continue uh, their attacks uh, in Kherson region, targeting Russian support and ammunition supply points. Uh, and um, actually, uh, Ukrainian general staff report uh, of certain um, improvements in that area for Ukrainian forces. Uh, this is um, and this is something that goes in line with attack uh, on the bridge. Uh, we have confirmation uh, from military officials that the bridge uh, has been hit uh, twice. Uh, this is a very important logistics theory for Russian forces. And uh, for the moment, uh, Kherson uh, administration, Ukrainian administration, uh, Kherson officials, um, they confirm that Russian uh, forces have uh, certain difficulties with um, putting the bridge back to uh, normal and uh, back to operation because the damages are very, um, uh, very, um, uh, let, let, let's say, um, impressive, uh, uh, meaning that um, there is only cars, normal, ordinary cars can pass for the moment, no tracks or any, you know, heavy uh, equipment, uh, especially military equipment could actually go uh, over the bridge. So, uh, According, again, to the Kherson officials, uh, Russian forces are trying to find uh, who can help them to repair the bridge. And uh, th there are certain, you know, um, th there is certain information that they even look for uh, help, uh, look for the help from Moscow. But again, this we cannot confirm. This is just what we hear from uh, Ukrainian officials in Kherson. Um, in general, I should say that Ukrainian forces, and it looks like that uh, they actually concentrate their attempts uh, to uh, change a situation at the front line of Kherson region. And for the past weeks, uh, we receive more and more reports from Ukrainian general staff and from uh, military officials again uh, about certain um, actions that Ukrainian forces uh, are doing in that area. I'm going to come back to those regions, especially uh, with, you know, regards to Russia's latest objectives. But, you know, we're hearing as much as, you know, Ukraine is, is you know, um, attacking the bridge and Russia's um, defences. Uh, the Ministry of Russia is saying that its forces have also been uh, shooting down, um, uh, for example, Ukrainian Su-25 military plane. Uh, we understand this is near Kramatorsk. Uh, there's also been uh, shelling in Bakhmut. Uh, what more? I mean, what has been uh, Kyiv's immediate reaction to this? Uh, unfortunately, I cannot neither confirm nor say that this is something that didn't happen because there is no official confirmation from the Ukrainian officials. So for the moment, uh, we only heard this from uh, from the report uh, by the Ministry of Defense of Russia. Uh, again, for the moment, I cannot confirm. Uh, we probably have to wait for official reaction. It might come um, by the end of the day. Uh, but again, um, it's difficult to say because very heavy fighting are happening in that area. And every day uh, we receive reports that uh, Ukrainian forces um, defend the region and Russian forces are trying to advance. Uh, so this should be confirmed probably later on. But again, uh, we'll see if, if any comments, official comments from Kyiv uh, would come.
So we are wondering about Kharkiv, the city. Uh, we understand killing of at least two people, wounding 21. Um, we hear that uh, also shelling struck a mosque and medical facility, also a shopping area. Um, I can update you with the information. So just recently, uh, it was confirmed that unfortunately, um, the number of people killed uh, grow up to three people and 23 people are injured uh, due to this attack, uh, morning attack uh, on, in Kharkiv. Uh, I should say that Kharkiv uh, and Kharkiv region, uh, unfortunately, are under constant attacks for the past months uh, and especially past uh, weeks again uh, this you know attacks um, increased a lot uh, and especially this particular civilian area which is uh, called Saltivka it's quite um, it, it, a lot of people live there so it's it's quite big um, and we know that a missile uh, actually hit this residential area uh, as well as um, uh, public transport uh, waiting point, uh, which is also next to the food market. So it's very, uh, let's say, um, you know, active um, and um, uh, active, you know, place in the city during the morning and during the day. Um, so this is what we know from the official report from Kharkiv uh, administration, official administration, um, military administration. Um, uh, again, we are going to wait because uh, the numbers could change. Uh, but I should say that Kharkiv uh, is quite under under severe attacks, and um, it's one of the you know one of the front line places as well. Also, we're hearing, and this is from the United Kingdom's Defence Ministry, uh, saying that Russia appears to be prioritising uh, infrastructure. Um, um, it says that Russia is prioritising the capture of critical national infrastructure as their forces close in on Ukraine's uh, second biggest uh, power plants. This is northeast, east of Donetsk. Do you think that, you know, this are some of the things that are happening? And, and this is also, uh, when you compare that, to the recent comment of Russia's foreign minister, uh, Sergei Lavrov, implying that Moscow's strategy had changed uh, after the West supplied Ukraine a uh, longer-range weapons, saying that they might be um, now have to push Ukrainian forces um, uh, further from the front line. Uh, I should say it looks like that they are targeting this important infrastructure facilities because uh, we can see that uh, when uh, Russian forces were next to Kiev, they also were trying to control uh, the um, the plant in Chernobyl uh, in the Parisia region as well. They capture from the very beginning when they entered to the Parisia region, they captured the um, uh, the plant uh, located there. And now uh, this is um, another uh, thermal power plant, which is located next to Bakhmut. Uh, we receive reports from Ukrainian general staff that uh, Russian forces are trying to assault, uh, at least today in the morning, it was information that uh, Russian forces were trying to, um, were, were starting the assault and Ukrainian forces managed to stop them at that point. Uh, but again, we're hearing a lot that, um, uh, you know, quite a lot of fightings are happening around that area. And it looks like uh, that this is an important target. Um, so, we, we again, we hear a lot about this power plant these days, so it is probably a very important target for Russians and, of course, Ukrainian forces are trying to, uh, to, to, to defend and to not let uh, Russian forces enter the plant. Um, if we uh, talk about, if we yeah, discuss the point about what Mr. Lavrov said uh, recently, uh, according to Ukrainian, again, Ukrainian intelligence and this report just uh, coming in, that um, uh, together with also we know that U.S. Of, um, uh, U.S. officials also were talking about this, that Russian forces are trying to, you know, prepare this um, um, let's say environment for referendum, so-called as they as they did in Crimea back in 2014. Ukrainian uh, intelligence also confirmed that 
it is probably the plan. Uh, and uh, they can see that in Zaporizhia, Russian forces are trying to, uh, you know, appoint so-called again administration uh, under their control so and a similar thing happen uh, is happening in Kherson so what um, intelligence is saying that probably uh, Kherson region uh, which is now under Russian control and the Parisia region also which is under Russian control probably would be um, would be you know following the at least according to Russian plan, would be following the scenario of Crimea. But again, this is just, uh, you know, prediction. So uh, we have to wait again and see uh, how all this would um, evolve because um, there is, you know, no, of course, no assurance of any of such uh, movements. But this is how it looks for the moment. And, and uh, five months on, Russia has occupied parts of the east and also the south of the country. It has failed, uh, you know, in its original aim of occupying Kiev. But then, you know, the comments by Sergei Lavrov, uh, a lot of people are wondering how much more expansion in terms of this bombardment or how far Russia could go. Um, this is other than the Donbass region. And we understand that a lot of people are leaving uh, east of the country. Nine million refugees right now um, out outside of Ukraine. Um, Anna, do you feel safe where you are at this moment? Uh, you know, um, in Kyiv, if we talk about where uh, the place where I am located, um, it is quite safe, I should say. Of course, uh, there are a lot of risks. Of course, uh, people do not feel completely safe. But if you compare, so of course, if we compare with, you know, eastern part of the country, of course, it's much more safer. But um, uh, we know from, again, from general staff and from uh, the, the commander in chief that uh, Kyiv region for the moment is uh, more or less safe. Again, it's not safe at all, just, you know, if we talk about normal safe, but uh, just if we compare with other parts of the country. Uh, but again, a rocket and missile attacks could happen any time. Uh, so the city of Kyiv is living without air raid sirens for a couple of days now. And people are, you know, uh, I mean, they're both uh, happy about this, but at the same time, they are not because uh, last time when it was, you know, a long period uh, without raid, ra uh, air raid sirens, a Venice tragedy happened. Uh, mm. So this is, you know, very, it's very difficult to say if it's safe or not. It's safer comparing to other parts of the country, and um, this is this is what we, you know, feel here. And indeed, you have to be cautious as well. Anna, we always appreciate your time on the program. Do stay safe. Thank you for joining me. Thank you. And Russia says sanctions imposed against it by Western countries over its actions in Ukraine will not cause it to change course. During a call with reporters, government spokesman Dmitry Peskov said it was obvious that no sanctions, even the harsh ones, have ever made countries they were imposed on in any part of the world change their position. He said instead European countries end up hurting their own citizens because the EU prefers to maniacally stick to sanctions which harm its own interests and more importantly, harm its own citizens. We'd mentioned this earlier in the program. Russia today resumed gas distribution through the biggest pipeline between Russia and Germany after a 10-day outage, easing concerns that the maintenance period will be extended. Europe has been on edge about the restart of Nord Stream 1 gas pipeline after annual maintenance, with governments bracing for possible further supply cuts amid an economic tit-for-tat with the Kremlin over the war in Ukraine. The pipeline transports 55 billion cubic meters, BCM, a year of gas under the Baltic Sea and has been offline since July 11 for annual maintenance. On the operator Nord Stream AEG's website, physical flows were at 21,388,236 kilowatts uh, per hour for 0, uh, 600 to 700 CET uh, from zero previously. The resumption in gas flows could take several hours.
coming up on The World Today. Surgical team in South Africa uses the Da Vinci uh, 11 robot to perform surgeries. Do stay with us. Welcome back. At least Mario Draghi has resigned as the country's prime minister one day after he had told the president he would remain only if three parties in his government backed him in a confidence vote. President Sergio Mattarella has asked him to remain as caretaker leader and early elections are expected before the end of the year. A smiling Mario Draghi received a lengthy round of applause from lawmakers in the lower house of parliament as he prepared to announce his intention to resign. The 74-year-old former European Central Bank chief, who appeared surprised to receive such a tribute, jokes that even central bankers have their hearts touched sometimes as the applause finished. Unelected, Draghi, who has led a broad coalition for 18 months, later tendered his resignation in a meeting with President Sergio Mattarella. Mattarella's office said the head of state had taken note of the resignation and had asked Draghi to remain in a caretaker capacity. Draghi was dubbed Super Mario for his handling of the Eurozone crisis as head of the European Central Bank. In February last year, he was given the task of guiding Italy through the COVID pandemic and economic recovery bolstered by a big EU package conditional on major reforms. He first tendered his resignation a week ago when a populist party in his broad-based government refused to back his economic package, prompting a political crisis. The parties set to benefit most from the political crisis include the far-right League and centre-right Forza Italian, and both snubbed Mr Draghi in Wednesday night's crunch vote. Italians were disappointed and concerned at Draghi's announcement of resignation. One respondent said this was not the right moment for a government crisis, that this should have been the moment for Italy to get back on its feet, not the moment to stop. Another respondent pondered plans to return to her country permanently after spending the summer in Italy, but now that the government has collapsed, she has changed her mind. Draghi's resignation plunges Italy not only into political uncertainty, but also risks undermining efforts to secure billions of euros in European Union funds, tackle a damaging drought, and reduce its reliance on Russian gas. Let's get some updates from the COVID-19 pandemic now. Experts from the European Centre for Disease Control and Prevention say Europe is facing a new round of COVID-19 outbreak with the relaxation of social restrictions and the spread of new Omicron subvariants BA.4 and BA.5, which are both more contagious. A senior expert at the European Centre for Disease Control and Prevention, Agoritza Baca, says the number of hospitalizations and death rate will continue to rise in the next few weeks. The new round of outbreak is mainly caused by the new subvariants of the Omicron strain and their infections currently account for 80% of the new cases in Europe. Backer says that to curb the spread of the virus, Europe may have to reintroduce preventive measures such as the mandatory wearing of masks on public transport and limiting the number of people in large gatherings. Earlier this week, Hans Kluge, director of the World Health Organization Regional Office for Europe, issued a statement saying that in the past six weeks, the number of COVID-19 cases tripled in the European region and nearly 3 million new cases were reported last week alone, accounting for nearly half of all new cases in the world. Although the rate of hospitalizations due to COVID-19 has doubled over the same period, admissions to intensive care units have so far remained relatively low. 
And in Japan, the number of new coronavirus infection cases in Tokyo has hit a record of 31,878, far outstripping the previous record set in February. It is the first time the daily tally surpassed 30,000 cases in the capital city. The number of serious cases and deaths remains low, but officials have warned that they are rising. Japan's chief cabinet secretary, Hurukazu Matsuno, has called for the highest vigilance against COVID-19 infections adding that new infection cases across Japan has reached its highest level ever and hospital occupancy rates is becoming higher, although it depends on the region. And this is happening right now. U.S. President Joe Biden has tested positive for COVID-19 and is said to be experiencing very mild symptoms. According to the White House Press Secretary, the 79-year-old president will go on carrying out duties of the office and has begun taking a course of the antiviral treatment, Paxlovid. Well, we understand also from the White House that the president went to bed, felt fine, but he didn't sleep well. Uh, but he is continuing to isolate and carry out his duties fully. Hopefully, we'll be uh, talking to our Washington correspondent for more on that. But staying in the United States, according to Johns Hopkins University, the country has recorded more than 90 million confirmed COVID-19 cases nationwide, with more than 1.02 million deaths. Meanwhile, a total of 595,594,121 vaccine doses have been administered across the country. According to the data of Johns Hopkins University, since officially reporting the first detection of COVID-19 on January the 21st, 2020, the U.S. took around nine months to have more than 10 million cases, but only less than two months to have another 10 million cases from January the 1st to March the 20th. 24th in 2021, more than 10 million new cases were registered in the country. In 2021 alone, more than 30 million people were infected in the U.S., surpassing the threshold of 50 million. As the Omicron variants became rampant in the United States, it took less than one month to add the total infection number to over 60 million on January 9, 2022, were still just 12 days later, the overall case load reached 70 million, meaning over one fifth of US residents was diagnosed with COVID-19. The number of COVID-19 infections has been increasing in the US as a new highly contagious Omicron subvariant is driving up infections even among the fully vaccinated. Our Washington correspondent, Maria Bird, joins us now on the latest from the United States. Hi, Maria. Has the White House mentioned uh, anything further about where the president likely contracted the coronavirus? Well, the president, as we know, has been on international travel for quite some time. And so they're not sure if it was between the international travel. There was a large White House press pool that traveled with him. And so that is um, some of that is obviously being contract traced at this time. Uh, so they're not quite sure exactly where he could have contracted it. We also know that um, he is currently being quarantined within the residence of the White House, but will be carrying out his full duties uh, throughout his stay, mild symptoms. And as you stated before, he is actually on treatment at this time um, just to ensure that he continues with the mild symptoms. He's been double boosted, and so they do expect that he will have a full recovery. And Maria, do we know what strain of the coronavirus that the president has? We know, of course, the Omicron sub variants B.4.5 seems to be widespread um, as of now. Yes, they have not stated that that is the actual um, the actual version that he has contracted, that the Omicron sub variant is what he actually has. But uh, they are speculating that that could be it based off the fact that that is a very highly contagious um, variant that we know um, most of the vaccines at this time are not able to um, protect individuals from. So from those who might have contacted, um, you know, the, the president, uh, what about the first lady, Joe Biden? Is she in quarantine? The first lady was on travel to Michigan and Detroit um, at a school and she did test negative. And so at this time she will continue with her trip. 
Um, she has been in communication with the president and says that he's doing fine. And when she returns, she will most likely not be able to be in the same quarters with him until he tests negative. This once again brings to light the efficacy of vaccination. Uh, the president is fully vaccinated, has also received two boosters, and yet he came down with COVID. Um, how are Americans, vaxxers, anti-vaxxers, reacting to this piece of news? I think Americans were waiting to see when this might occur. I think that Americans are not surprised, especially, as you said, there has been recent news, uh, especially here in the U.S., around the um, heightened spread of the virus with this new subvariant, And so with that being the case and knowing that they are trying to get another vaccine approved that will potentially uh, cover individuals from the subvariant, I think that uh, this was not necessarily a surprise to Americans, but it is definitely putting, I think, a heightened approach on what we will see as far as potentially uh, reestablishing some of those mask mandates and other uh, mandates that were in place um, earlier in the year. But well, do you think that that will happen, uh, seeing as, you know, um, a lot of people were excited to come out of those mask mandates and also uh, considering the different uh, governors of the different states in the United States, those that are for and against um, mask mandates and vaccines as well? Well, what you'll begin to see is those areas that are in a high area of um, contraction rates and increased hospitalization rates, you will probably begin to see mandates um, end up back in those areas. We know that California has already put some mask mandates back in place for indoor use only for individuals when they're indoors. But this is going to definitely be, I think, uh, one of those moments that you'll begin to see governors reevaluating what's actually happening in their state and then looking to see whether or not they need to reestablish any of the mandates they had before. Maria, thank you for that update. Thank you. Let's head to other health matters. According to a report released by the uh, U.S. Food and Drug Administration, alarming levels of heavy metals have been found in some common foods in the United States, and infant food is the hardest hit of food contamination. The latest Total Diet Study report shows that of the thousands of food samples they collected, 15% contained lead, 43% contained arsenic, and 61% contained cadmium. For example, canned tuna is surprisingly high in arsenic and cocoa powder and sunflower seeds are very high in cadmium. Among the 384 food samples for infants and young children tested by the FDA, 21% contained lead, 51% contained arsenic and 65% contained cadmium. The food samples with the highest levels of arsenic came from baby cereal, teething biscuits and some puffed snacks. Another 3% of food samples were found to contain mercury. Scientific studies have shown that toxic heavy metals can harm in fact neurodevelopment and affect brain function. The reports also pointed out that most American infant food companies did not test the heavy metal content in the finished product, but only estimated the heavy metal levels based on the raw materials, which makes the number in the report lower than the actual levels. Last year, hundreds of families across the U.S. collectively sued the baby food companies involved in heavy metal cases, and lawyers representing the lawsuit took aim at the FDA, charging that the agency has long protected the industry's interests rather than consumers' health. Over in South Africa, public hospitals are turning to robots to assist in performing complex medical procedures and surgeries. The robots assisted in removing a cancerous rectal tumour from a female patient in Cape Town. A surgical team led by Dr. Tim Forgan used the Da Vinci G robot to assist in removing a cancerous rectal tumor from a patient at the Tigerberg Public Hospital in Cape Town. The robot, which has four arms and is controlled in real time by Forgan via an immersive 3D console, is the most advanced surgical robot currently used in Africa. It is one of only two such robots on the continent both of them found in South African public hospitals in Cape Town. Fortunately, the um, Western Cape Department of Health bought two Da Vinci robots, which is the Da Vinci XI, which is the most technologically advanced robot, surgical robot that's currently available on the market. 
And what they're designed for, what they, what they do, is they allow you to work very, very finely and with great precision. And they magnify the image that you're seeing a lot more than normal laparoscopic stacks. So we can see much more detail. And then the instruments, you can move, maneuver with a lot more accuracy and do finer work and get a better result, so you can preserve more organs that way. The system is being used mainly for complex type surgeries. The first operation with the new robot occurred at the Tigerberg Hospital in February this year, with dozens more successfully completed since then. The patients have done very, very well. They go home much sooner, so our average length of stay is three days. So you have a major procedure, we remove big cancers, and three days later you're at home. And the complication rate has definitely come down. And chatting to the patients post-operatively, they have a lot less nerve damage. You can see that their function is way better than what we had originally. And we were doing all these ops with keyhole surgery. So we were do already doing them with very small cuts, people going home after five days, now three days. It's definitely improved their quality of life. And they, say, they all tell me they feel so, they feel as if they haven't had an operation. Two years ago, the hospital also introduced a robot on wheels called Kania during the COVID-19 peak to help patients connect with their relatives via video or a voice call. This innovation like this one is very excellent. And also knowing that we just had a pandemic where um, family members couldn't go into the hospital. Now with this innovation bringing your family members closer to you since they can't be able to vis uh, physically come into the hospital. That brings in a lot of um, relief and also it's good psychologically for a patient as well. So this uh, innovation, it's, it's quite good. Family members dial into Kenya and visit patients remotely. Doctors and nurses use a phone app to steer the robot in and out of hospital wards to make it convenient for patients to easily communicate and request help when they need it from hospital staff. Away from health, Ranil Wickremesinghe has been sworn in as the new president of Sri Lanka by the chief justice of the country. The six-time prime minister won 134 votes in the 225-member parliament in a vote count on Wednesday after his predecessor, Gotabaya Rajapaksa, fled the country and resigned from his post last week. Wickremesinghe is unpopular among some protesters who stormed his official residence this month when he was prime minister and burned down his prime private house. Street protests over Sri Lanka's economic meltdown simmered for months before boiling over last weekend when hundreds of thousands of people took over government buildings in Colombo, blaming the Rajapaksa family and allies for running away, uh, for running away inflation, uh, shortages of basic goods and corruption. Still to come on the program. We have the latest weather reports from around the world. Please stay with us. Turkey has denied carrying out any attacks targeting civilians in Iraq's Dohuk province where a strike killed eight people and wounded 23 others. He called on Iraqi authorities not to fall for what he called a trap. The Turkish Foreign Minister Mevlut Cavusoglu was emphasizing the government's position during an interview on Turkish media. He rejected claims by Iraqi officials and state media that he had carried out an attack on a mountain resort in the northern Dohuk province. Iraq summoned Ankara's ambassador to Baghdad over the attack, and its state agency said the government will call back its chargé d'affaires in Ankara. Kavusoglu said on TV the Turkish military operations in Iraq have always been against the outlawed Kurdistan Workers' Party, saying the attack on Dohuk was also carried out by what he called terrorists. The fierce artillery bombing hit a resort in Zakul a city on the border between Iraq's Kurdistan region and Turkey. All killed were tourists. 
Turkey regularly carries out airstrikes in northern Iraq and it sends commandos to support its offenses as part of a long-running campaign in Iraq and Syria against militants of the Kurdish PKK and the Syrian Kurdish YPG militia. Relatives of the victims in the attack have been overwhelmed by grief. One said they lost two relatives, including a child. In Erbil, the capital of Iraq's Kurdistan regions, Foreign Minister Fuad Hussein and the President of the Kurdistan Regional Government, Nechevan Berzani, laid flowers on coffins that were later transported by a military plane to Baghdad. Iraq's foreign minister visited the site of the strike. He told reporters, we have big problems in Iraq, political problems, but there is a unified position among all the representatives of the Iraqi people. Until now, the information that we received is that there was a bombing in the safe touristic site artillery, and this calm, beautiful touristic village was hit. Meanwhile, dozens of Iraqis gathered outside the Turkish embassy in Baghdad in protest of the attack. Protesters clashed with police outside the Turkish embassy in Baghdad, while south of the capital in Najaf, protesters hung signs calling Turkish President Tayyip Erdogan a terrorist. The top United Nations envoy to Iraq condemned the attack in a statement published on Twitter and called for an investigation. The U.S. says it's monitoring the situation. Let me just say uh, in the interim that we're aware of the deadly shelling in northern Iraq today. Uh, I killed and injured numerous Iraqis, including uh, civilians, according to these first reports. Uh, we reaffirm our position uh, that military action in Iraq should respect Iraqi sovereignty uh, and territorial integrity. We express our condolences to the families of the victims of today's uh, actions. Uh, we emphasize the importance of ensuring civilians are protected. Uh, and we will continue to monitor the situation closely as additional information uh, emerges. For the time being, we'll defer to our Iraqi partners for uh, additional comment. Kurds make up 15 to 20 percent of Turkey's population, but have faced persecution there for generations. The wildfires are still raging across Europe. Let's check in on Slovenia and Albania, where smoke billowed over forests as the heat wave spread northeast. Slovenia is struggling to contain the wildfire due to low water supplies and a lack of extinguishing equipment. But the situation calmed yesterday, according to the defence minister. The country's prime minister says the problem is because the fires are popping up around Europe and the EU's help system is overloaded. Thankfully, no wildfire fatality have been reported in either Slovenia or Albania. And take a look at what firefighters are battling in Spain. The country's military emergency unit had to be called in to contain wildfires spreading across the country. They have had to drive by roads surrounded by flames to make any impact. Soldiers have had to build firewalls with a digger and using water to extinguish the fires burning vegetation on mountains in the Zaragoza province. Spain's 10-day heat wave is the third longest since records began, considering its preliminary end date on Monday when temperatures dropped in most of Spain, but it could be extended as temperatures are expected to rise again in the coming days, according to the National Meteorology uh, Service, AMET. Our weather reports takes a different turn in New Zealand, where a wild storm system has been moving across the country, uh, burning, swirling winds, uh, surging waves, heavy rains to the capital, Wellington, and causing flooding in Christchurch. Now, New Zealand's Met Service announced a severe weather warning for Wellington and nearby regions with winds of 130 kilometer per hour and waves of seven meters pounding the area. The weather has caused most flights in to Wellington to be cancelled and the ferry services that connect the country's two main islands to be suspended. Waves breaking onto some roads has forced them to close and one of the city's beach suburbs has been cut off.
or here in West Africa, floods are being reported in the Senegalese capital, Dakar, causing the collapse of a section of one of the main highways into the city. The floods are the result of torrential rain across the country. Cars, scooters, pedestrians inch through torrents of brown knee-dip water as unusually strong downpours battered the semi-arid city whose sandy roads and flat-roofed houses are poorly equipped for the July to October rainy season. People have been patrolling uh, non-conventional means of transportation as horse carts make trips um, carrying people through the flood for a fee. Rain typically falls in intense uh, um, bursts during Senegal's uh, rainy season. Showers last a few hours and are spaced out over several days. The National Civil Aviation and Meteorological Agency says Monday's downpour was particularly zealous. Um, however, with 84 millimeters of rain recorded in Dakar in just two hours. Meanwhile, one person has been killed, at least 25 others injured as tornadoes hit China's eastern Jiangsu province. In Yangcheng City, a tornado damaged houses and brought transmission towers crashing to the ground, disrupting the power supply to 5,800 households. Repair teams expected power to have been fully restored by this evening. In Yingtang City, or southeastern Jiangxi province, workers have been overhauling power lines amidst extreme heat to ensure adequate power supply for the surrounding area. Many Chinese cities have broken new records for high temperatures over the past few weeks, escorting heat and contrasting relentless rains wreaked havoc, with forecasters expecting weather extremes to linger for days. Cars and ambulances struggle to navigate flooded streets outside of a hospital in Charleston, South Carolina on Wednesday. PhD student Claudia Salazar filmed vehicles driving through heavily flooded streets during a seasonal downpour. Recently, a tropical storm brought flooding to several parts of South Carolina over the 4th of July weekend. The flooding comes as climate change dominates the headlines, with extreme heat bearing down in parts of Europe and U.S. President Joe Biden under pressure from Democrats to declare a climate emergency. Well, meanwhile, talking about uh, climate change, U.S. President Joe Biden said on Wednesday that um, climate change is an emergency but stopped short of a formal declaration yeah, announcing a modest package of executive actions and promising more aggressive efforts. The president made the comments during a visit to Massachusetts and a historic heat wave uh, battering Europe and the U.S. Some 100 million Americans from New York City to Las Vegas will be under heat warnings this week. This is, of course, uh, before he tested positive for COVID-19. Well, who knew he had it in him? France's President Emmanuel Macron impressed children and probably the rest of the world when he shot a basketball into the net, scoring a free throw on the first try. During a visit of a former industrial complex converted into a sports center in the southwestern town of Tabez on Thursday, Mr. Macron was challenged by the young sports enthusiast to shoot the ball. He accepted the dare, taking off his jacket before netting a clean shot. to applause and cheers from the children. Through the visit at the Escalade, La Cuisine, listed as an Olympic training site for rock climbing, um, Mr. Macron aims to highlight the importance of sports in the country ahead of the Paris 2024 Games. Let's watch him do his thing. Definitely a good boost uh, to the young ones there. Well, that's it on the program. Thank you for watching. I'm Melissa Antonoka.